This is CBC Here and Now. Left off the bus. If my son's not on a bus by Wednesday, then I'm not, you know I got to go Thursday morning and let my employer know that uh, you know my job is still interrupted twice a day. We'll hear from one of the hundreds of families that still has to find a way to get to school. Coming up on Here and Now. Instead of the 50 or 60 shows that I did last year, uh, I did three all summer. I'm hoping the province is going to have something for us, and I'm, I'm pretty sure they will. It's been a rough seven months for local musicians and artists. Some are hopeful that the government will give them some support in tomorrow's budget. If you scroll through social media sites, you'll see a lot of car break-ins lately. We're going to talk to victims of this crime and hear what police have to say about it. I'm Jeremy Eaton. I'll have that story coming up. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. And I'm Carolyn Stokes. We begin tonight in Central. That's right, with an update on a proposed palliative care centre. The Lionel Kellen Hospice has hired an architect and advocates say that's a big step on the road to becoming the first facility of its kind in this province. Here Now's Garrett Barry takes you inside. Inside this room, a vision for end-of-life care. It'll provide a home-like environment with all of the prerequisite professional and counseling supports. This model suite has been set up for three years, and now, finally, the rest of the building is changing too. We always knew what the finish line would look like. Um, we didn't necessarily always know how far, whether it's a 100-yard dash or a marathon, and it's certainly been a marathon. It has been a long road. This committee was formed in 2014. Six years later, they've got a building and an architect to plan renovations. It's never been so close. We hope that we will be ready to go to tender in early 2021. And from the point of that, we anticipate about 10 to 12 months before uh, patient one. The hope behind this project is to give patients and families facing end of life care a third option one that combines the safety and security of an institutional setting, but with more of the comforts of home. It can actually be about uh, a meaningful conclusion to a rather substantial and unique journey. And that's all predicated on it actually being done properly. From his job in the emergency room, he's seen the need firsthand. Most people die in hospital. But that number has been decreasing as families look for options outside a hospital bed. There's not a lot of accommodation made for longer stays, for more comfortable environments, and for families, and especially extended families, to be visiting. Right? So it's very much about come in, be treated, and move to the next case. It's just not the setup that you need when you're on your last 30 days of life. This institution would be the first of its kind in the province, a dedicated palliative care center. The board says the advantages are clear and the community has bought in. Yeah, I became more aware of it after one of my friends I played hockey with. He got cancer and he's only about 60 years old and he died. And I went up to the uh, hospital and I mean, he was in a room that if you put two or three people in there, it was crowded. Last year, he walked from Bishop's Falls to Grand Falls, Windsor to raise $9,000 for the Lionel Kellen project. You know, there was carts around and everything else, and he, he just, you know, wasn't the right way to die, put it that way. Those memories are why he walked, and why he says he'll keep volunteering and raising money when the Lionel Kellen Hospice is finally opened. Garrett Berry, CBC News, Grand Falls, Windsor. Mother Nature rolled back the calendar for us today. <laughs> Feels very much like summer out there across the board. Take a look at these temperatures, mid to high 20s. Even seeing these warm temperatures through Lab City as well, 20 degrees. Churchill Falls uh, seeing a high near 19 this afternoon. No surprise, we broke a few records. St. John's uh, broke a record for 2015. 23.3 degrees was the afternoon high today. And if we look at these temperatures through Central, uh, Gander almost 26, 25.8, and then back 
back in 1999 when broke a record in Corner Brook, 26.8 degrees. Not only was it hot, but it was humid. A number of areas seeing Humidex values in the high 20s, even reaching the 30 uh, mark in some cases, certainly here in St. John's. Now we're going to see this stick around for a couple of more days, but I'll have all those details and your full forecast coming up. COVID numbers are rising elsewhere in the country. Ontario recorded more than 400 new cases today alone. With no new cases in Newfoundland and Labrador and just two active cases, the health minister is warning people not to get complacent. Let's bring in here and now's Peter Cowan. So Peter, what else did the health minister say today? Carolyn, part of the message was about vigilance and the other part was reassurance. And let's start with that vigilance part. He says just because the case numbers are low here now doesn't mean somehow this province is immune to that second wave that we're seeing in places like British Columbia, Ontario and Quebec. He says people need to keep up the public health measures here in this province. And anecdotally, though, people are doing a pretty good job. I go out in public places, in government buildings, people are wearing masks and they are doing their level best to keep their distance uh, and uh, they are to be applauded for doing that. I think the numbers are good because of that and because of that the numbers will remain good as long as we keep doing it. We know that travel is one of the key reasons that COVID comes into this province. So with the cases rising elsewhere, do we need extra measures in order to protect people here in Newfoundland and Labrador? And John Hagee says, no, at least not yet. If the surges that you see in BC or Ontario suddenly start popping up in PEI or New Brunswick, uh, that would tell a different story. Uh, and similarly, trying to relax them at some point you have to realize that we're not doing them because we want to or we feel particularly uh, disinclined to be nice to people. It's because we feel we need them there to protect the general population uh, of, of the province. And I would argue that those measures are working. Our case numbers are very low uh, and have stayed that way for a while. Now, he is also reassuring people that if case numbers do start to rise, the province is ready. Uh, contact tracing, public health has shown they're very quick at being able to respond. And when it comes to things like personal protective equipment, they have been quietly building up more of a stockpile so they'd be ready in case we started to see hospitalizations here in Newfoundland and Labrador, something we haven't seen for months. And so far, though, the good news is that second wave that we're seeing in other provinces right now isn't even a ripple here. Carolyn? Thanks so much, Peter. That's hearing us. Peter Cowan reporting live. Well, despite the positive news in this province, the world has now lost more than 1 million people to COVID-19. That's one death every 16 seconds, and it's not over yet. Our world has reached an agonizing milestone. We must learn from the mistakes. Responsible leadership matters. Science matters. Cooperation matters. And misinformation kills. Particularly concerning now is COVID's acceleration rate doubling from half a million fatalities just three months ago. Experts believe inadequate testing and possible concealment by some nations mean the number of deaths reported is far lower than the real tally. The U.S., Brazil and India account for nearly 45% of all reported pandemic deaths worldwide. All have lifted social distancing measures in recent weeks. Hundreds of students still don't have a seat on the bus. COVID-19 restrictions mean fewer students on buses to allow for physical distancing. The education minister says thousands of students have been allotted seats, but one dad isn't convinced all will be sorted by the end of September. Here and now's Mark Quinn reports. Prior to school opening, we were more than 6,000 students didn't have a seat, uh, so we were literally in the thousands. Uh, today, we're in the hundreds. Corey Foster is one of the parents disappointed by this year's transportation plan. Almost a month into the school year, his son Alexander still doesn't have one of these on one of these. Absolutely terrible, because there's zero communication whatsoever. You know, my job is still interrupted twice a day. I have no indication as to when this is going to change. Um, and yeah, I'm just left in the lurch. 
This morning, the education minister apologized to parents like Foster. I understand uh, that, you know, allowances had to be made by families and, uh, you know, very uh, sorry that you had to go through that. This is an unprecedented year. Osborne also praised school officials and transportation companies for getting 145 more buses and drivers into the system since August, an effort that cost the province $11 million. So the busing contractors rose to the challenge of acquiring those buses. What proved to be equally challenging uh, was the uh, recruitment of drivers uh, and training of drivers, um, and they've risen to that challenge as well. But for Corey Foster, there's still some uncertainty. I mean, if my son's not on a bus by Wednesday, then, I'm not, you know, i got to go Thursday morning and let my employer know that, uh, you know, my job is still interrupted twice a day. Some of those buses that have been brought in are as old as 13 years old, but the minister says he's certain they've been thoroughly inspected and they're safe. He expects all students who are eligible for a seat will have one by early next week. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. Well, there are still big questions about the future of the White Rose oil field in our offshore and Husky Energy's very presence in this province. As Terry Roberts reports, Husky continues to pin its hope on a partnership with the federal government, despite no firm commitment from Ottawa. After a series of setbacks, there's been some good news in oil. I am announcing $320 million to support jobs. An injection of cash from Ottawa to protect jobs and help lower carbon emissions. A special thank you, of course, to my friend and colleague, Canada's Natural Resource Minister, Minister Seamus O'Regan, for delivering such a great announcement today. Exploration incentives from the province. We think we've made a, an excellent move here. And what appears to be a deal to park two offshore drill rigs in the province until the exploration climate improves. But the future of this massive construction site in Placentia Bay remains unclear. The cash flow requirement is the issue here. It's, it's a, it's a short-term affordability issue. The West White Rose project is 60% complete. A fixed wellhead platform that will pump oil back to the Sea Rose production vessel is critical to the long-term viability of the field. Before the pandemic hit, there were 1,000 people working on the project. Promises of billions in royalties and taxes. Hundreds of new offshore jobs. Now it's in limbo as Husky waits for an answer from the feds. All the while reminding the public what's at stake in rare media interviews. What we're talking about is supporting a project that can provide 15 years or more of economic benefit uh, to the province. Um, and we think is very much aligned with some of the messages we've heard from government this week. It's, uh, it's low carbon intensity, it's a project that has the potential to be GHG neutral, uh, carbon neutral, um, and it contributes um, to that long-term economic objective that the government is talking about. Husky won't say how much it wants from Ottawa. It would support a uh, short-term impact both to the jobs we could offer in the near term and when those economic benefits would arrive. Real change and sustainable growth must come from the private sector. Insiders say a Hibernia-like federal partnership in the project is a long shot. With climate change as a backdrop, the federal Liberals are betting heavily on a green economy. But O'Regan isn't ruling out Ottawa help. We want to find a way to make White Rose and West White Rose work. They've got uh, you know, a lot of different ideas and I think that they're willing to be creative and we are too. Husky says some very big contracts hang in the balance and some big decisions must be made soon or the 2021 construction season could also be lost. In the event that we can't get the project moving again, then we have to stand down some of those contracts. And, and that would be the discussion about, you know, that we need to have with the individual companies concerned and see what can be done to maintain options for the future. If this expansion project is cancelled, it dramatically shortens the life of the White Rose Field and strips the province of one of the pillars on which an already shaky economy is built. Terry Roberts, CBC News. St. John's. Well, it's budget day tomorrow and many are eager to see the province's fiscal plan. Artists are no exception. The pandemic is pinching profits. And as Colleen Connors reports, musicians are hopeful the provincial government will come through with some support. 
the usual busy summer season for local musicians and artists is about to come to an end. But musicians in Cornerbrook have not seen the numerous gigs and busy nights like they're used to. Instead of the 50 or 60 shows that I did last year, uh, I did three all summer. Just a few friends. Hamlin would have played at bars once or twice a week, weddings every weekend, and toured summer festivals. Because of COVID, he's downsized big time, even selling his house. One saving grace, the Rotary Arts Centre, where he's played a few gigs at half capacity. Uh, so it's been great in that way, but still, that's only a show a month instead of a dozen, right? He wants to see the province step in. It'd be wonderful if there was some sort of a program for artists uh, that can expedite the transition that we're going through to get to this new reality that we're in. Uh, as a way to uh, kind of jumpstart maybe some streams or some alternative venues that are safe for everybody to be in. Uh, just to get all of the very talented artists that are in Newfoundland because we've got an embarrassment of riches. Uh, just a way to get them in front of audiences again. Well, actually I played 80% uh, of the gigs inside. Okay. In the corner over here. Right here? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Dave McHugh is usually performing to audiences aboard cruise ships by now. He spends six months of the year doing that. Instead, he's playing covers outside at the Garden on Broadway to a half-capacity crowd. It's, it's a crazy, crazy time. I who could have predicted this, you know? McHugh is confident the province will back local musicians. Federally, I think everybody, mostly, we're taking care of this year, so I'm hoping the province is going to have something for us, and I'm, I'm pretty sure they will. I know that might sound uh, <laughs> hopeful, but I, I really do think that. I mean, sometimes uh, artists sometimes are, are not always the first served, I guess. And I don't think it's intentional, but maybe where it's a little less uh, structured sometimes. But I, I think they're, they're going to come across with something. The province says that something is already happening by supporting people and businesses through the pandemic. Government says expect an update in the budget tomorrow. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Corner Brook. Minimum wage will increase by 50 cents an hour on Thursday to just over $12 an hour. Those advocating for a much higher minimum wage say the increase isn't enough, while business groups say now is not the time for an increase. Here now's Heather Gillis has that story. On October 1st, the minimum wage will increase from 11.65 an hour to 12.15. How much of a difference will the increase make for minimum wage earners? For someone who works 40 hours a week, an extra 50 cents an hour means $40 on a bi-weekly paycheck before taxes are taken out. For someone working 30 hours a week, it's $30 before taxes. And for someone working 20, it's $18. So this is still a poverty level minimum wage. It just barely kept up with inflation. Mark Nichols is with 15 and Fairness, a group fighting for a $15 minimum wage. He says the province's minimum wage is one of the lowest in the country, only a ahead of Saskatchewan, Manitoba and New Brunswick. He says the majority of Canadians live in provinces where the minimum wage is at least $14 an hour. Still, he doesn't think this upcoming increase will make a huge difference. I don't think they're going to be able to uh, go out to restaurants when they couldn't before. It's not going to make that kind of a difference. Meanwhile, business groups like the Employers Council oppose the minimum wage increase. They say the economy just can't absorb it right now because of the pandemic. Businesses are just barely surviving and many are closing. Richard Alexander, the executive director of the Employers Council, says the increase doesn't make sense since governments are helping businesses with wage subsidies and deferring taxes and fees, while also increasing labour costs. You know, some business owners, they break down. They, they are worried about their survival. They're worried about their ability to continue to employ people. They've had to cut back on hours. They've had to cut back on staff. Alexander says times are desperate and the real impact won't be felt until the winter when many businesses don't make as much revenue. Uh, we're, we're in this for the long term and we need to do everything that we can to help local businesses survive, uh, people who have invested their lives, and, and protect those jobs. And making those jobs more expensive is not going to do it, unfortunately. Heather Gillis, CBC News, St. John's. Well, if uh, social media is any indication, many people are falling victim to smash and grabs. That's when thieves smash your windows, often vehicles, and then they take off with your valuables. While there are no statistics to suggest that crime is on the rise, here in St. John's, many drivers have been hit. Here now, Jeremy Eaton spoke with two of them today. 
You can't see the crime, but you can hear it coming. A door handle shaking. What happens next has rocked Donald Barker. So shocking, like, uh, you know, I live in Claremont. We don't see this type of thing. It just totally shakes any sense of security that you have. It's like all day yesterday, I was just, it was on my mind, and I just couldn't concentrate on anything else. It just really rattles you. Despite having power tools in the cab and a dash cam that captured this scene, the thieves only took a $10 bill from the cup holder. It's obvious to me that these thieves, they're watching these parking lots and watching for an opportunity to break into a vehicle. They managed to hit two other vehicles besides mine. Barker reported the incident to police. That same morning, Wallace Organ woke up to a similar fate. Very uneasy, uh, especially with everything on the go. Now, you don't know who's getting in your vehicle, what they have, or anything like that. Uh, so it makes you very uncomfortable that you're being invaded, uh, even when you're sleeping. For Oregon, it's the second time his car has been broken into. Six weeks ago, my car was broken into. Uh, nothing was damaged, but my wallet was stolen, amongst a few other things. Uh, lost uh, almost, almost $800 in on my credit and debit card due to taps. Oregon did exactly what police want people to do if they're in a similar situation. No matter how minor or small you think it is, the RNC wants to know about it. And the reason for that is because uh, we're looking to allocate our resources uh, effectively and efficiently. Even if the vehicle has gone through and nothing's taken or nothing, nothing's damaged, uh, we want everyone who's been a victim of this to uh, contact the RNC and to advise us that this is going on in your neighborhood. As for what people should do, Always lock your vehicle when you're away from it. Uh, if you're leaving it unattended, make sure it's locked. Uh, try to avoid leaving anything valuable in the vehicle. And uh, if you do have to, make sure you keep it out of sight. Police are reminding people to report any suspicious activity in your neighborhood to them. As for Barker and Oregon, they wanted to speak out in the hopes that others won't wake up to this. A seat full of glass. Jeremy Eaton, CBC News, St. John's. Well, seven families, including one from this province, are suing an Ontario sperm bank. They claim it misled them about a donor's academic and medical history. Now, according to the families, the clinic told them that there's extensive screening, but the families say they were lied to about the level of education their donor had, and they weren't told about his genetic disorder that can cause people to lose their ability to walk. Each family is seeking roughly $4 million in damages. Well, starting on Monday, Marine Atlantic isn't going to give priority boarding to trucks carrying food, pharmaceuticals, and other essential supplies. The practice started in March as a way to ease supply chain issues during the pandemic, but according to the Retail Council of Canada, it has meant fresher produce and a more reliable schedule for businesses, and they'd like priority boarding to continue. But Marine Atlantic says switching back to first come, first serve is a step towards getting things back to normal. Well, sort of related to food, I suppose. Maybe that's what this bear was after or could have been simply just curious, I suppose. During search and rescue training in the Torngat Mountains earlier this month, a polar bear apparently tried to get into a Canadian Forces chopper. The cormorant was parked at the uh, Sagalek airstrip near the tip of Labrador and judging by some of the muddy paw prints, the crew figures a polar bear poked around overnight. Nobody was inside the chopper as the bear was trying to peel it open. According to the forces, the bear pushed in an emergency door and removed a small cover panel. They don't think that the bear actually got inside. The crew waited a couple of days for replacement parts to be flown in, but now they're back home with a pretty good bear story to share. Lovely evening out there, temperature-wise. Clouds have moved in tonight. Things are going to be a little bit unsettled over the next couple of days, but this heat sticks around, so I'll have all those details coming up.
This weather forecast is brought to you by Newfoundland and Labrador Tourism. Take the time to explore this fall. Learn more at stayhomeyear.ca. Ashley is here now with a look at the weather forecast. Another sweltering day for many people today. And I know that you've been keeping a tally on how many 20 degree days that we've hit. So how are we doing? We are doing very well <laughs> considering last year. Let's take a look at those numbers. Considering last year we were at 35 days. We've now reached uh, the 20 degree mark 60 days so far this year. And if you remember 53 days is what we normally sit at. So it has been a beautiful summer for the most part. Here's where we've been sitting other places as well. Uh, 76 times in Gander, uh, many places well above average. Uh, Stephenville 62 and then Happy Valley Goose Bay at 53. So yes, it has been a wonderful summer today. No, uh, no exception, even though we are into fall. Here's where our temperatures are still sitting. Beautiful evening right now. 22 degrees in St. John's, 25 in Corner Brook. And then we do unfortunately get into some of that colder air up through Labrador, uh, northern portions of Labrador Nain at four degrees. Makovic, you're currently sitting at five degrees. The other thing is this dew point. We've been talking about the dew point for a while now. This is where uh, we're sitting right now. 18 in St. John's, 19 in Deer Lake. So this is when we start to get into the uncomfortable uh, portion of that. And uh, because of that, we are sitting and seeing Humidex values in the high 20s, low 30s. And even uh, though it's, we're seeing those cooler temperatures down along the south coast, it's still quite humid. It's feeling more like 21 in Port Basque, more like 22 in Lab City. So it is it is pretty nice out there now as we head through the next couple of days. Tomorrow certainly going to be another humid day. As we head into Thursday, we're going to start to see some of that drier air move in. So it'll be humid for eastern areas. And then as we head into Friday, that's when uh, we'll start to see that much drier air move in. So it won't be as nearly as humid as what we're seeing now. Taking a look at the current satellite and radar, we can see that onshore flow with this humid air mass keeping things foggy down along the south coast. That will generally continue as we head through the night tonight and the potential for some showers as well. And I'll just zoom out one more time. There's that deep trough we've been talking about the last couple of days and that ridge of high pressure rotating counterclockwise again, pumping all of that humid air and that will uh, continue like I said, for the next two days at least. So as we head through the night tonight, that onshore flow down along the south coast, going to see the showers or drizzle creep a little bit further north as we head through the night as those temperatures uh, dip just a little bit closer to the dew point. And then we've got the potential for some showers along the west coast, certainly through Labrador as well. See some periods of rain move in, uh, but overall those temperatures are going to be mild again, 16 to 19 degrees across the board. These winds are going to stay gusty as well. So 30 to 50, maybe even gusting around 60 kilometers per hour for areas along the West Coast. 10 degrees for Lab City tonight, 16 in Happy Valley Goose Bay, but again, going to stay chilly uh, for Nain, about 14 degrees. Now you'll note these temperatures are actually going to climb for Happy Valley Goose Bay towards the evening hours, and then uh, as we head into the morning, we'll see those temperatures eventually drop down a little bit as well. So here's uh, the forecast for tomorrow, at least the future tracker for tomorrow. Not a whole lot of change because we're still in that southerly flow. So areas along the south still in that onshore flow. You're looking at drizzle and fog through most of the day. It'll start to creep a little bit further north again, potentially with some cloudy periods of potential for some showers as well through central, uh, maybe even for areas along the Avalon as well and then periods of rain will move in for Labrador. That'll spread across uh, as we head into the evening hours and eventually through the overnight. Now with this, we're going to see the southerly flow and the winds are going to pick up along the west coast. So Environment Canada has issued a uh, wind warning for around uh, parts of the west coast. Anywhere you're prone to southerlies, you could see gusts anywhere from 80 to as much as 100 kilometers per hour. And through most of the afternoon tomorrow in the Rec House area, you will see gusts upwards of about 100 kilometers per hour. Temperatures will be just as nice of tomorrow. Here's where you'll be sitting 23 to 25 degrees. But again, those winds breezy 40 to 60 kilometer per hour expected uh, a little bit cooler along the south coast. But another 20, another beautiful day tomorrow. Uh, we'll see temperatures in southeastern portions of Labrador reaching the near or around the 20 degree mark. However, temperatures will dip uh, for you in the west. So you're going to go back down to those double de or 11 degrees for Lab City rather. And again, those winds out of the east, about 40 to 60 kilometers per hour. 
heading through Thursday. Things will start rainy and then eventually clear for the island and then we'll see more showers move in as we head through Friday. So it is looking like we're look, uh, looking at a little bit of unsettled weather. Temperatures will be mild again though, 20 to 22 degrees for Thursday and then back into those single digits for Labrador uh, and then 18 degrees for Cartwright. But then by Friday, that's when we get into some of that colder air. Things will uh, be beautiful though, temperature wise uh, for the island as you're looking at 17 to 20 degrees with plenty of sunshine on tap. And then eventually by the end of the weekend, that's when we'll see those temperatures dip for eastern areas. That's certainly going to happen through central as well. Our overnight lows are going to go back into those single digits. So hang on to or uh, enjoy the weather while you have it for sure. Eastern Labrador, single digits by Saturday and Sunday, and then same thing for Lab West. Now I wanted to share this beautiful shot, fall apple harvest in Selvage. Thank you so much to Bill Sparks for sharing that lovely photo with us. And if you have any weather photos you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Tomorrow is budget day in Newfoundland and Labrador and with the pandemic, it's sure to be unlike any other budget day this province has ever seen. As the former finance minister said in July's fiscal update, unusual seems to be the new normal. That said, government has promised no major surprises in this year's budget. Joining me now to talk more about expectations is chartered professional accountant Larry Short. So, Larry, what do you expect to see in tomorrow's budget? Well, let's put a couple of goalposts in place. Uh, to start with, in a normal non-COVID year, what we've been running in the last number of years has been expenses of about $8 billion and revenue of about $7 billion. Uh, so we've been running a deficit of about $1 billion. The fiscal update uh, showed us that the deficit this year is $2.1 billion, and the indications are that we're not going to see that much change in what is being presented tomorrow. Uh, that being said, I wouldn't be surprised to see a bit of tweaking. The marginal tax rate on the highest income earners is a little bit below what the rest of the country is uh, paying, some of the provinces are, are charging. And uh, there's a lot of talk about wealth tax. So that might be something that we would see tomorrow. The fiscal update didn't include any of the federal money, the $146 million for the uh, restart and also the $26 million for education. How do you think that could change the lay of the land in the budget tomorrow? As well as um, that revenue coming in, there's always the question of what are the assumptions being made on the price of oil? Do they expect the price of oil to go up significantly? And therefore, how does that affect the follow-on deficits? And in many ways that presents how the real budget is what I'll say uh, will be when it's coming up this spring because it'll be unusual to see any major changes right now particularly with a uh, by-election on the go minority government etc whereas this spring coming that's probably where they're going to introduce any significant changes. Premier Fury is in campaign mode right now for right. the by-election yeah. in Humber Gross Morn. How do you think that will affect the choices made in the budget this year? Well, uh, so a couple of things again. One is that uh, he's also appointed a, a, an economic recovery commission. They haven't yet met. They have not you know, provided any um, uh, input at all. So normally you would go through a period of time of, uh, particularly being a new uh, premier, is let the uh, voters get to know you, get in, get in power, get in position, and then establish what needs to be uh, changed in order to rectify the situation that we're in. So that's why I'm saying that th we'll probably see some tweaking tomorrow, but uh, th the really interesting one is going to be uh, the February-March uh, uh, period of time, the budget coming out then in 2021. Premier Fury, when he was campaigning for the Liberal leadership, talked about introducing $25 a day child care by the year 2022. I'm sure a lot of parents, a lot of people will be looking to tomorrow's budget to see if there will be any mention of that. Do you have any expectations for seeing that in there? I, I wouldn't be surprised to see it in there, and, and that's what I'm talking about is that we have um, new revenue figures that are coming in from uh, money coming in from the feds, what expenses are going to be associated with that. So it, somehow or another, it looks like we're going to net out to the same number. So that would not, it would not be unusual to see that, that uh, introduction of that plan in uh, tomorrow's budget. All right, well, all will be revealed tomorrow. And Larry Short, you're going to be with us for our budget show tomorrow. That's correct, yes, I'm in lockup with you guys. Okay, great, we'll talk to you then. Thanks so much. More than welcome.
Welcome back. The Royal St. John's Regatta is trying to become more accessible, so it's partnering with the Able Sail NL Group to bring more inclusion to Kitty Vitty Lake. Now, Able Sail is a group that focuses on getting athletes with disabilities onto the water, and it runs this sailing program at the Royal Newfoundland Yacht Club, and it started another one at Kitty Vitty Lake over the summer. And today, the Regatta Committee announced that the sailing program is going to continue, so it won't just be a one-off because the regatta was cancelled because of the pandemic. The committee is also going to be installing a lift to make fixed seat rowing more accessible. It hopes that one day athletes with disabilities will be able to compete in the regular races on regatta day. Earlier this month, here and now told you how Olympic hopefuls from this province aren't happy about the Acarina's closure during COVID, especially since other pools across the province reopened more than a month ago. Well, a big announcement today, Memorial University and the province have partnered to give the pool a major boost, $600,000 towards reopening. It's been quite the adjustment for kids and adults alike to learn to live with the confines of COVID-19. The Aquarina can and will be a refuge from some of that daily stress. This funding will allow the works to reopen the Aquarina pool to lessons to the community and to recreational swimmers by mid-October. Reopening this pool means that St. John's Legends, Edge Diving Club and Sea Stars Artistic Swimming Club can get back to training, practicing and competing. Reopening this pool means seniors can get together for their routine swims. And reopening this pool means our athletes can continue their high performance training towards the 2022 Canada Summer Games in Niagara and eventually here at home in 2025. I'm very excited, you know, it really benefits me a lot. I qualified for Olympic trials last year, Canadian Olympic trials, and um, yeah, so that's, and I'm qualified for Eastern Championships as well. I really would love to get in the pool and race and be able to qualify for more times for Olympic trials. I've definitely missed it. It's great for opportunities. You know, all the national and international meets are uh, long course time, so 50 meters, and this is the only 50 meter pool in the province. Uh, I would definitely like to qualify for the Tokyo 2021 now uh, Olympic trials. So uh, getting back training here is really important for that uh, goal. I'm Nathan Wilson and I'm 11 years old. How much are you looking forward to two weeks from now? I'm really excited because we've only been using pools that are 25 meters and right now we've only been at the mud pool and the mud pool is not even 25 meters. It's only 25 yards, which is equivalent to two, 23 meters. So when you're training like for those 400 uh, freeze and 800 freeze and you're practicing them in practice, it's not really that distance because it's two meters short every 25. To other news now, in this day and age, it sounds almost unheard of, but Nova Scotia is planning to poison one of its lakes so that it can kill off an invasive species. And the target is illegally introduced bass. Perhaps even more surprising is that local environmentalists as well as anglers are all on board to rid Piper Lake of this problem once and for all. Paul Withers has that story. We'll try to get that afterwards. We're going to go to commercial right now.
Canada has added nearly 1,400 new coronavirus cases in the last 24 hours. But along with the worry of the growing numbers is another concern, longer wait times just to get tested. Today, the federal government signaled a big step toward alleviating that problem. Salima Shivji reports. As the demand for tests keeps growing, so too the pressure on the federal government to speed up the process. There's no one that's been jumping up and down, uh, you know, screaming for the rapid tests more than I have. Rapid tests where a swab doesn't need to be sent to a lab to be analyzed, severely cutting down on the wait time to get a result. Ottawa today announcing it's buying one such test that can deliver results in a matter of minutes. The government of Canada has signed a new agreement with Abbott Rapid Diagnostics for up to 7.9 million rapid point of care tests for COVID-19. Care molecular instruments. But today's move is only to reserve the rapid tests and a spot in line with the company. The test hasn't yet been approved by Health Canada, even though it's already in use in other countries like the U.S. Might have to isolate for days. The opposition is accusing the Liberals of being behind the ball. Yet people around the world have access to at-home testing or rapid testing. And nobody in Canada does. And that's his fault. But the government today defended the pace of approval, saying safety is paramount. We have doubled our people and we've sped up our processes to review tests and grant decisions quickly within 40 days of an application. As much as we'd uh, love to see those tests as quickly as possible, we're not going to tell our scientists how to do their job and do that work. But we are, however, ensuring that as soon as those approvals happen, we are ready uh, to deliver these tests across the country. A promise that's still pending and one that can't come soon enough for those anxious for a test. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, Justin Trudeau says Canada will commit more funding to help developing countries affected by the COVID-19 crisis. The Prime Minister made the pledge today during a virtual meeting he co-hosted with the UN Secretary General and Jamaica's Prime Minister. From ensuring equitable access to vaccines to providing more time for distressed countries to make bilateral debt payments, including Caribbean and small island states, we're working on concrete options that will help build a more resilient world for the short, medium and long term. Earlier this morning, I announced that Canada will invest an additional $400 million in humanitarian and development funding to fight COVID-19, with even more in the years to come. We will make sure that women and girls who've been disproportionately impacted by the consequences of COVID-19 benefit from this new funding. Well, the government of Canada also recently promised $220 million to a global initiative that will purchase COVID-19 vaccine doses for low- and middle-income countries. Donald Trump and Joe Biden face off tonight in the first presidential debate of the U.S. election campaign. The event is taking place at a university in Cleveland, Ohio. Chris Wallace from Fox News is going to moderate it. The 90-minute debate is going to be divided into 15-minute segments focusing on six subjects, and they include the coronavirus, race and violence in the U.S., as well as election integrity. That debate starts at 10.30 Island Time, 10 in most parts of Labrador, and it's not going to begin with the usual shaking of hands between the candidates because of all of the various COVID-19 precautions. Well, staying in the United States, fire is ripping through California's wine country. The fires have incinerated homes and businesses, forcing 60,000 residents to flee or to stand by, waiting to be evacuated. California's governor declared a state of emergency in Napa and Sonoma counties. And further north in Shasta County, three people died in those fires. In all three areas, firefighters have been battling flames from the air as well as from the ground. But the wind-driven fires just keep getting bigger and bigger, scorching everything in their way. Now I'm going to get to that story that we started talking about a bit earlier about Nova Scotia planning to poison one of its lakes to kill off an invasive species. Illegally introduced, smallmouth bass were first discovered in Piper Lake in July 2019. Located in the middle of the province, this tiny body of water has now become the front line in the fight against this invasive species. They're very difficult to control and, and really if you, if you don't 
act quickly um, and, and efficiently, you know, the um, ability uh, for you to do something about it you know, diminishes with time very, very quickly. A berm and netted culvert were built to seal the outflow. Technicians netted, fished, used electric current, even partially drained the lake to reduce oxygen levels in an effort to get rid of them. Hundreds were removed, but not all. And we were close, uh, yet bass still managed to survive the winter. Uh, and, and in fact, this spring uh, successfully spawned again. We knew that we were going to have to do something a little bit uh, more, more drastic. Drastic now means pumping in the pesticide rotenone. It targets fish because it's taken in through their gills and has been used elsewhere. The outflow from Piper Lake will also be blocked. The product will be confined to the lake itself. And rotenone actually breaks down very, very quickly. Uh, it starts to break down within hours uh, and within a few days uh, would be undetectable. And this is why it's happening, to protect a surviving population of Atlantic salmon downstream in the St. Mary's River. These images were captured last month. The water system is home to native trout and salmon and still free of aggressive invasives. Piper Lake is part of the headwaters that feed into the St. Mary's. We looked at this as balancing the, the short-term costs of treatment uh, versus the long-term risks of not treatment. Conservation groups are on board with what the province wants to do. What's at stake? Uh, it literally will change the entire ecosystem. Uh, it may take many years, but uh, literally the entire ecosystem. We could lose the entire trope population. Other systems have lost the entire trope population. Uh, all the work that we've done over the years uh, with the salmon population. The Department of Fisheries and Aquaculture is in the middle of the application process to use known in Piper Lake. If approved, they will apply between 35 and 40 liters in mid-October. Paul Withers, CBC News, Piper Lake.
we talked about how warm it was earlier. I wanted to share another little tidbit with you. Deer Lake reached a high near 26.6 degrees. This is the warmest on record this late in the season. The previous was back in September 23rd, 1965. And by the way, that's when those records started. So it certainly has been a very warm uh, day and will be tomorrow morning as well. This is what you're going to wake up to 18 degrees in St. John's, although it'll probably be a little drizzly. And then we've got uh, 17 18 degrees pretty much everywhere else these temperatures in Happy Valley Goose Bay as well so it will be a beautiful start and then a beautiful afternoon as well here's where you'll be sitting temperature wise 23 to 25 degrees although it will be quite breezy with gusts upwards of about 60 kilometers per hour then late in the day those areas prone to southerlies will see those even stronger wind gusts on your street ooh, 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 on your street he, he. hi my name is policy now from Porter Grave, Newfoundland, Labrador. This summer, I won a t-shirt design contest for Arm Shirt Day. Here's my winning design. On it, you can see a few indigenous signs. I hope everybody remembers to wear their orange shirt on September 30th. This is Policy Naltuk, reporting from Porter Grave, Newfoundland, Labrador. Back to you, CBC. <laughs> How fantastic. sweet was that? Okay, you passed the audition. I'm out of here. Uh, Palasi, uh, thank you for that reminder about uh, Orange Shirt Day. And congratulations on your winning t-shirt. And uh, we're going to be marking Orange Shirt Day tomorrow as well. See you then. Good night. Good night.